Hey, Josh, thanks for joining us today. Is where you're getting started. Give us a little background on yourself. Yeah, so thanks for having me. So my name is Josh Atkins, and I'm based in Louisville, Kentucky, and I look after the life sciences vertical at Qualtrics. Qualtrics is the leader in experience management. Uh, for those who are the uninitiated on what we do, we are we help the biggest, most complex brands in the world listen, understand, and take action on employee feedback, customer feedback. For the sake of my team, it's patient feedback, it's physician feedback. We want to improve experiences for people and help people understand how to deliver better experiences. Well, that was, sounds easy. Yeah. Yeah. It's not a problem at all. It sounds, it must be like order taking all day. You can't keep up, right? Yeah. Just hot credit cards. That's all we're getting all day long. It's just people just voting stuff. Hey, we got this Amex. We got, we got budget. We got crazy budget. Let's do it. Well, yeah, that's it. That sounds like a lot of technology where the outcome is really great. But is it hard to kind of articulate how you do that? I'm guessing. No. Yeah, I, mean, I always start with the start start at the start at the end. Like, what is this going to look like? Like, and then we'll work backwards from there. Like, what is your what is your ultimate goal? And and for me, and what I lean into with our team is that you know we're not selling widgets, and I'd love to not sell technology, although it is a technology platform. We are selling this outcome of hey, having a better experience as a patient with this. A pharmaceutical drug with this medical device. This is important work because it can save lives. It can extend lives. It can help people who have some physical condition that is hindering their life to improve their life, right? It can help a physician who's who has burnout, who's not seeing the value of their work. We can help them understand what the physicians, uh, what the patients value about them. So it's, for me, it's, it's, it's very much a, a mission um, and if we start there, if we come from a place of selling from here, as opposed to selling from here, a lot of times, I think we're in a lot better shape. I, I was going to mention you, you went straight for the emotion. Yeah. Did, did you learn that in your acting career or? Yeah, uh, it's, uh, everything is a feel to me. Everything is emotion. And I think, um, the more that we kind of lean into the emotional aspects of it, you know, I, I think in my career earlier, I, I had um, I had a hot blooded Irishman that lead that lives inside me sometimes. That uh, comes you know out. what they're like. Yeah, uh, yeah. I have a, it's it's so you know you get caught up in things and you get a little bit overheated and that's emotional where your emotions take you in the wrong way. But I, I for certainly I think I think my theater background helped me not only understand but be okay with being emotional, right? And and opening up here and selling from here um, and and creating a point of view from here as opposed to just being robotic yeah. in what we're doing, right? Right, because sure. we're emotional creatures. We are. Yeah, we buy it. We buy emotionally. We love emotionally. Hopefully, in the best ways. We sell emotionally. Um, it, it's all it's all the same motion. It's all the same same feeling. And, but that doesn't go very consistent with becoming a sales leader. You know what those rascals are like. Yeah. Yeah. I know. It's, it's a wild, it's a wild thing. It does for me. It yes. actually makes, it actually makes, it makes sense for me because my theater training is all about ensemble, right? It's all about listening. It's all about tossing the ball. It's about not in necessarily moving barriers and boundaries but overcoming them it's about sharing and listening right and it is all emotional it's a heightened state of emotion the theater itself is a heightened state of realism yes right uh, so you're seeing people on the stage and they're much bigger because they're playing to the back of the house yes same thing in sales leadership for me it's understanding the different personalities that might be on my stage at any given time I can't treat one of my reps one way and treat another rep the exact same way because they're two different people. They have two different selling styles. They have two different authentic motions. So for me, and I'm a, I like bound. I like I like uh, like moving boundaries for people and removing barriers so that people can do good work. Um, so for me, it, it feels right in the right in the sweet spot of emotional selling and 
and and leadership. Well, it's good to hear somebody come from a different performance background than just athletics. You know that that's, yeah. that that oh. se- seems to be everywhere in sales and kind of beat to yeah. death. But sure. you know, I've had you know people from the debate team, musicians, and I actors. Love that. Yeah, because sales is a performance. Absolutely. Requires those re- rehearsal, improvisation, reading the room, timing, listening, listening. How about this? How about okay with being rejected? Yeah. How about that? And and the coaching. Absolutely. Which, right? Because when you were an actor, you had a director. Yes. And probably some other people that told you what to do. And sometimes you Where? probably didn't agree. <laughs> Absolutely. It, it is a collaborative process, right? It is. And to your earlier point, um, I, I too have had the uh, locker room style of leadership, which the, the, the language of that trade is, is four letter words and very aggressive uh, type of leadership. And, and, and that turns me off. Um, I'm coming from the exact opposite school, which is, for lack of a better phrase, let me love on you. How can I love on you the most in order to make you feel like you're worthy and that you can do this and put you in the frame of mind where you can sell as authentically as you can? People don't people don't sell well when they're scared. Right, because we go into flight, fight or flight. That's survival right. Survival mode. And have, right. have you ever seen anybody very creative when they're just trying to survive? Yeah. And that's the thing, man. I, you have to feel free to take your shot, to shoot your shot. Yeah. Right. And if it's crazy, I've had, a, I, I've been lucky that I've had a lot of great sales leaders in my career who have leaned into every crazy idea that I may have had. And you have to, when it comes to prospecting, when it comes to just continuing and involving and selling between the big, selling between the big stages, a lot of things happen between a discovery call and a demo. There's a lot of selling that happens incrementally throughout a sales process. And you have to be a little bit risky to, to be successful in this business, I believe. And the only way you can feel comfortable being risky is if you know that some that the walls aren't going to come crashing down with you, shoot your shot. Yeah. If you think, as long as it's a thoughtful shot, right. as long as you can articulate it, and the juice is worth the squeeze, and you aren't going to like torpedo your deal or hurt your personal brand. I love, I love creativity. And I'm sure you got pushback earlier in your career. You know, I looked at your career and there was one company that stuck out that has a reputation of just the opposite of this. And we don't have to name it. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're everywhere. Yeah. They're, it's very uh, authoritarian, survive, kill or die. And one of these things does not belong, right? You're looking at my, at my, at my CV, right? Uh, yeah. And, and, um, it was a fit for a while, and then I got an opportunity to go do something else. Like I, I try to pick up multiple things, multiple lessons from every stop that I had. And, and for the one that you're talking about in particular, one of the lessons I walked away with was, as a leader, that's not the way I lead. Yeah, it's not for me. And there are some people who are, and, and, and you know, and the reality is, one of the people that I worked with very closely at that uh, organization kind of led me into my next one. Right. You fit, you tend to find your people in those types of organizations. Right. And for me, it was anybody else who has a personality, who's excitable, who loves just being happy and positive and gregarious and probably a little bit more smart aleck than they need to be. Those are my people. And yeah. I, I found a few there. And is that what motivates you? Uh, from a personality perspective, those type of people? Uh, from a career, you know, that creativity, because, I mean, yeah. sales has that, has the variety, has drama, has a lot yeah. of drama in it. Well, you know what really, um, you know, I, I, very coin-operated for a while. <laughs> okay, here comes the truth. If we're, <laughs> if, we're, if we're being like, here's the brutal truth, Brian. Uh, you know, for, I would say for the most part of my career, when I got into sales and I realized, you know, I was a theater kid who stumbled into sales because I had someone push me there. But, um, and then I realized how much money you could make in sales. Um, 
so I got more interested in that. And I was like, oh, you can make a lot of money in sales. So I leaned in heavily there. It wasn't until probably my last six or seven years when I started dealing with experiences that I started saying, "There's this is more of a mission thing for me. I love selling things and I love the art of selling things, but unless for me, there has to be blood going to it. So what was what inspired me before was making more money so that I could afford to have a wife and maybe some kids one day. It turned into, okay, I've got that. That's great. There's got to be something else. And for me, it was like, uh, how can I help people with what we do? How can I serve people? What can our product do to make lives better? Yeah. And customers sense that too, don't they? 100%. People still buy people. People people know when you're legit. And that's why every single call that I, they, I'm on, we talk about, and, and every interview that I have with a potential account executive, I'm like, why do you want to do this? We're in life science. Why do you want to do this? Why do you want to sell this? What's your why? Connect why you want to sell this to me personally for you. I can tell you about me. I have an eight-year-old autistic son, right? So when I think about experiences that we have had as a family, when it comes to the pharmaceutical industry, to healthcare, my, my why is how can I make his experiences and my wife's experiences and my why and my experiences better as we're moving through this system in order to get the right medications to help our son, yeah. right? To make it less strenuous on my wife, right? So what's your why? Like what, what, what is, what, what, why do you want to sell this? You could sell anything in the world. Right. People who come to me have been in sales for a long time. I get really good people who want to sell what we do. They could sell anything, but you got to be, you got to want it to want to sell this to me. And well, tell me about the sale. Who on the customer side wants this? Yeah. Or, or you, know what? To it. Uh, you know, it's funny. You're, you're, you're begging and borrowing and stealing from different buying centers. Really? I think this, this idea of a chief experience officer is relatively new. You know, the last sure. four or five years where systems are actually, where health systems are thinking about it. For us, it's, um, I, I feel it's a couple of places. One could live under marketing. There's somebody who's a, a senior director of employee experience or customer experience that lives under the marketing um, uh, a brand if there isn't an experience department, which I'm surprised more and more people are getting experience departments. Also could live in operations. Because the act of putting feedback into the hands of the front line is an operational motion. So you're going to have to sell to that person anyway, eventually down the line. You got to make, you got to connect with that person. So typically, I always, we always try to at least get some buy in from operations. And is that the hardest part is getting that first call? Or is it keeping the momentum going throughout the process? Well, I, I think what's happening, you know, it's it, the, the biggest, the biggest challenge sometimes is, is just doing nothing, right? I think the, the hardest part, what we do is, I think we, our, our message resonates when we're giving it in the right way, our message will resonate with you. If you think about the best experiences you've ever had in your life with organizations, a lot of names pop up. You're probably going to talk about Delta. You may talk about Marriott. You're probably going to talk about Chick-fil-A. You're probably going to talk about a Home Depot or some of those things. The program is run by Qualtrics, right? Think about those best experiences. The Marriott program is run by Qualtrics. So some of those things where you're like, that message resonates. In a consumer-driven world where people's expectations are changing, they are no longer accepting bad experiences. They want the same experience from you that they got on their last flight from Delta. Point blank. But your market is more high demand, low supply versus medium demand, high supply, right? There's a million hotels. Yep. Yeah, but but it's still but it's still you have you have to listen. You, you have to listen or, or or they will go somewhere else because consumers have choice. Patients have choice now. Right. In order for them to, in order for a patient to stay in your clinical trial, you have to listen to them. You have to understand what they're feeling. 
right? And if you don't, there's a good chance they're going to drop out and you're not going to get the outcome that you want, right? Yeah. They're not going to feel supported. And I got to imagine that the the product is reasonably expensive. It's not a commodity. So you have to justify this through the, the organization that probably didn't budget for this or plan for it. Yeah. And I think what you're getting, again, what's important and what we talk about is how, how do we tie to initiatives? Enterprise Selling 101, right? What are the big boulders that this company is trying to move this year? How do we tie into that and who owns that initiative? Right. Let's go talk to that person whose job it is to manage all of this, manage the, the clinical trials for this new this new drug. Yeah. Right. They, it has to be a success. Let's let's go make that person successful, because if he's successful, he's going to drag us along for the ride. And what was your sales journey like? What were some of the, the epiphanies you had along the way? Kind of what do you yeah. wish you learned, you know, 10, 15 years ago that, you know, today? Man. So many. I think uh, my journey was um, I was a, uh, a theater actor in Chicago. Um, I, I was doing odd jobs in the afternoons and daytimes in order to, to kind of continue Live. feeding myself. While I while I went to while I went to the theater at night, and I had a job during the day. I, I sold books at Barnes and Noble, and I I did um, I did tours for the Chicago Trolley Company and the nice. Double Decker. So if you ever go through the city, mm-hmm. here, this is where Ferris Bueller's dad works, right here to the yeah. left. Um, I did that for a while, and then I got to the point where I was like, okay, I need a steady nine to five job because I need health insurance, and I wanted to take it seriously. So I start. I got a job as a market research specialist where I was calling health system saying, Hey, are you still using that Meditech device? Are you still using Cerner as your EMR? And I, most people I noticed on the floor had no personality whatsoever. They were just asking questions oh, and getting boss. off the phone. I'm sitting there like just, to, you know, talk to people. Um, and um, one day I was walking to the restroom and I happened to walk by the VP of sales office a woman named Amy Burgow. And she said, Hey, here for a second. I, was, I didn't know. I didn't think she knew who I was. Uh, she said, I hear, I hear you out there. You're funny. And I said, thanks. She said, I, do you want to get into sales? And I said, uh, sure. Yeah, I could do that. No problem. <laughs> sounds great. Sounds, sounds super easy. Uh, and she said, uh, and she's like, oh, cool. So she was she was responsible for the distribution. We were collecting the information, and they were selling it back to the industry. A few weeks later, she said, you know, listen, I'm not going to have budget for another salesperson for another year. What I did do was set up an interview for you at a startup that one of my friends is, is working on. So she effectively kicked me out the door, nice. which I'll, I'll, I'll forever be grateful to her. Another through line in my career is the impact of women sales leaders who are female. Um, and that started it. I, I got essentially what was a, a business development role at the startup. And uh, and then we're off to the races. And were you a natural or? I mean, I can talk to people. That, that's I what mean, they I'm saw in you, right? You had the yeah, cool personality. And, yeah. I, you know, I, 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 you know. But I think you kind of evolve as a salesperson, right? I think it's the same same deal with theater, right? You you go in, you look at you know a side for a play, right? And they say we're looking for, you know, give me a chubby cheeked, gray haired Irish guy, and you're like, I can do that. Um, but it don't tell you about the personality. So you're looking at it and you're going, oh, is this a is this a is really is a Matthew McConaughey type role? Is this what is this right? And so I think I was trying to put on the persona of a salesperson for a while character. before I actually, before, before I, yeah, the character of a salesperson before I actually started leaning into the, I bet this would be a lot better if I was just me because no one is me. That's, that's the Trump. That's, that's, well, the, that's the card that I have. Yeah, because then you can start thinking about what the client wants to hear instead of how you should appear. That's right. That's right. I'm just the guy. And leaning into vulnerability. Yeah. You know, I think um, I read, I, I, you know, I've heard, I've listened to a few of your uh, your podcasts and you've asked, you know, 
what's your superpower? Or what did what did you wish you would have known then that you know now? And it's like the quicker in my career, I, I wish I would have gotten to just being vulnerable quicker. I'm okay being vulnerable, but having that kind of go into my my sales career earlier and, uh, and, and not like trying to actively work against that, the more I embrace that, I think the better I got. Yeah, because like in acting, when the scene's over, you're talking to the director and the other actors. That's yeah. when the truth comes, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And no one cares. I think the other thing is on the other side of the table, they're just people who are trying to get through their day too. Right. They're, they, they're not interested in BS. Right? They're interested in having real relationships with real people. And can they trust you? And if they can't trust you as a person, how the heck are they going to make the decision to put their personal brand on the line to bring in their chief marketing officer, their chief experience officer, the chief executive officer to meet with this person that they themselves don't believe is authentic? And are they going to open up if you're not opened up? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yep. Yeah. You got to show it. You got to show it. And how about the the complex side of B2B sales, learning about how to get deals done within companies? Because when you go from like a simple sale where it's one to one, now it's, you know, one to many or many to many. Yeah. And the, the default is to do nothing or wait or do it someday. Yeah. How'd yeah, you learn that it, stuff? Again, Really good. I think a combination of really good sales leaders and and, and trial by fire. Another um, another great uh, sales leader that I had is a guy named uh, Matt Carroll in Chicago, who um, he helped me at that startup, and he's been kind of a sales mentor for me, you know, my entire life. Is you know he was seasoned executive, and so having conversations with him where he would talk about building champions. And like, what is a champion, right? And let's let's get let's get it straight. This person is a coach. This person's not a champion, right? You know why I know? Because that person can't stroke a check or tell another person to stroke a check. That's a champion. You just have a coach or someone that likes you, right? And so when you're talking about the enterprise and that selling motion, <clears throat> building of champions, the continual testing of champions. Is something that's so important. And again, doing your homework. Did you read that 10K? Did you look at what this person's purpose, like you did with me? Did you look at their LinkedIn profile and find out who they are as a person and what they're interested in achieving, right? People expect you to do a certain level if you're going to call yourself a sales professional, right? And did you make that mistake of... Sure. That, that nice oh, coach sure. who was really Yeah. Nice. Oh, of course. Right. Yeah. 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 You're like, you get happy years. You're right. And you're like, oh, yeah. You, you're Josh, you're great. I think you're awesome. You know, love your product. This is great. You know, yeah. Absolutely. You can come, you know, take me out for a bourbon. Absolutely. Let's go grab dinner. Like all those things that are that's the classic where you have to then go. Um, and this is another kind of piece of my success you want to call it but one of my personal things is that i always in deals have two ecosystems i have the deal team that i'm working with on a deal so that would be uh you know your your solutions engineer your sales engineer you might have you know other people you know looking into like working with you actively in the deal and then you're going to have for me it's like i've got three or four people that i like the way that they look at deals who aren't even close to the deal at all i don't want them close to the deal smart smart and I say, what do you think about this? This is what we're talking about. This is the deal. This is the pitch. This is the connective tissue. And usually those people will be able to say, oh, dude, what are you doing? Like, you're, you're too close to this. You need to put the golf club down and walk away because you're gripping it too hard right now. Yeah. Um, so that's, that, 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 that was helpful. That was something that I, I kind of learned the hard way early was that I was like, I'm, I'm meeting all these people internally. What I'm, what I'm pretty good at is networking internally at my companies. And so I started organically just having conversations. And one day I said, Hey man, listen, would you just take a look at what I'm working on? And that's how that started. And so I think that's how I kind of got over that initially. Yeah. <laughs> it's called Solomon's paradox. It's like, because you, you're emotionally attached to it. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. There's a lot of things you don't want to see because it yeah, ruins okay. the story. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And then the other thing is, you know, I think 
is sometimes it's being honest in in where your and where your deficits are, and being okay with that. You know, yeah. another great leader I had uh, was a guy named uh, Levi Sales. Literally the best name in the history of business development, Levi Sales. Uh, and he said he used to run the way he ran QBRs to me was perfect because it wasn't a, a, a colonoscopy. It was a how can we help you? How can you how, how we help you with your deal? Everybody open up their laptops. Josh's organizations that he's working with. Who do we know? How can we be helpful to him? It was expected that you were doing your work. But those sessions were not about like, I'm going to beat you into the ground. They were, how can I help you? And that naturally led people to, again, be vulnerable. Josh, do you have a champion? Oh, yeah, sure. No, I don't have a champion. I need a champion. Great. How can we help Josh? At, at, at that point alone is critical. One of the f- first startups I had, it was like we take the top five deals of the quarter. And it was yeah. board members, management. Who do we know there? Yeah. Anybody who's worked with any of these people before. Yeah. Yeah. And when a rep comes to you with a deal, what are you asking to be that, that sounding board? Yeah, I love it. I love, de- I, I, you know, I, I don't like the term, the phrase deal inspection, because I, I feel like I'm all like, it's, it's not there. It's just like, let's have a conversation. <laughs> Medic helps me. Yeah. I think medic as a as a as a framework helps me where we are in the deal. I I am, I am such a social seller by nature. Um, um, I I I am off the. I I talk about coaching trees a lot in the same way that like same football like thing. I have a I have a lot of coaching trees, and um, one of another one of my 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 sales mentors and really good friends is Samantha McKenna. Who runs Sam Sales? I worked for Sam um, at a company before she went to, before she started doing her own thing. And so she talks about show me, you know me a lot. So we're kindred spirits in the way of like how we look at things as people, like how we how we interact socially with people, and how do we use LinkedIn as, as one of those things. So I like to get in and ask, okay, who is this person? What are, what are they actually talking? What are what are their goals, needs, and objectives? Let's set aside what the company's doing. How do we make that person successful? What's a personal win in here? For Brian Burns, how can we make him look good? Um, I love, I lo- and it's a collaboration. You know, it's not a one slide and we're done. I think it's an ongoing conversation because deals change, right? Deals are like, if my team has heard this a thousand times, deals are like Grateful Dead songs, right? They just like, you never really know. <laughs> it's true. A good sales motion is like a Grateful Dead song to me. It's like, okay, here we're going to start here. But then we're going to go here. It looks like then, dancing, but I'm not sure what it is. <laughs> yeah, we we started in Uncle John's band, and then we ended up in Althea. <laughs> what town are now, we in now? <laughs> yeah, and now it's like we're back to we're playing in the band. But that's beautiful. That's music. That's theatrical to me. Yeah, right. I kind of appreciate that about it. And then it's unpre- and that's improvisational, right? It's like be quick, be quick, it be is. quick. Yeah. And yeah. When you see, or what do you think differentiates an A player, in your opinion, from a B player? So I think there's a couple of things, and I'll I'll set aside the things that I think are table stakes for enterprise sellers, right? Enterprise sellers are good listeners. They 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 listen. They don't wait to speak, yeah. right? I think that's table stakes. I think preparation. I think having a perspective on a business is critical that's one thing that separates a level players is if you're going to ask for my time i want you to have a perspective on how my business can be impacted by what you're bringing to the table and i want that perspective to be informed by the research you've done even if it's wrong that's okay because it still tells me you have a mind at work right it still tells me you've taken some time and that you've earned earned the seat at the table Right. I'm curious so I think having, about me instead of yeah, me having to yeah. listen to your blurb yeah. on the product. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna demo you to death. I want, you know, I, I can, I can, you, I can tell that this outreach email that you send me, you put no personalization into it. You have, you don't care about my business. You've mentioned four businesses, this proof points that have nothing to do with me, and you misspelled my name right, wrong. Right? You misspelled my name. So, so that that's that's a big deal. I think the other two things are one. 
um, their vulnerability leads people to ask hard questions and the, and, and be okay with that, you know, testing continual great a level players continually test champions. There are lots of opportunities that come up inside of a deal cycle that provide, that provide an opportunity to, to test your champion. Great. You just got a call from your champion saying that we won the deal. Fantastic news. The next question you ask them, did they call company that was involved in the RFP and tell them that they lost? If yes, great. If no, guess what? Yeah. We'll have some work to do. A lot of work. Right? That's a champion question, right? And that's a hard question to ask, but they'll appreciate it, right? And I think the other thing, again, is uh, the vulnerability. But then again, I think the champion selling motion, the continual testing is another thing that that consistently I see um, from the best of the best and humility, right? A, a players, they want to be coached. They want it. And they know that, and they, and they, and they know they don't know everything. And they're very, they're very upfront and honest with you about where and keenly aware of where they need help. Because they just want to move, they want to move the deal, man. They want deal. the deal. How do I win? How do we win? Great points, Josh. I really appreciate your time today. Where can people go to connect and follow you? Yeah, you can go and find me at, uh, let's see, it's at LinkedIn.com. It's Atkins Josh, Josh Atkins on uh, on LinkedIn. I'm learning how to play around with Twitter. I haven't really gotten into that game quite yet other than checking out news, but uh, maybe I'll, I'll start getting a, a more of an impact there. But that's where I am.